the conference, it's supposed to be about vision, but I will speak beyond vision because I'll be talking about sun language, which kind of also explains my career recently. So I started in computer vision, that's my background. But uh, after the deep learning, I would say revolution, I think that nowadays uh, all these perceptual tasks uh, beyond vision, so that's like a natural language processing or speech processing task, um, more or less they, they are following the same path, the same techniques and tools, and they all converge in sign language. So hopefully today after, even if your background is probably on, on vision, I, I hope that I can transmit that uh, multimodal problems are uh, very exciting, they are more complete, they are more real, and that you, if you're interested, it's a very exciting venue to attack, whether sign language or other multimodal problems. But you see that most of my story will be quite uh, neutral in terms of um, modalities. Having said that, let's start with the, this talk, so language translation and production. And basically I will explain the task, the problem, and pose you some open questions that we have nowadays in the community. So that's what's called multimedia, a multimodal challenges for all. First, I would like to acknowledge our wonderful team of current and former students, especially uh, the first lady, Amanda Duarte. She's a PhD student, last year PhD student, who, who has been driving uh, most of the work that I'll be presenting. Also uh, to our colleagues, uh, starting with Kay McGuinness, one of the co-chairs of the conference, and also uh, other experts in speech, language, 3D uh, uh, computation, that have made our research line on sign language to, to move forward. So this is the outline for the talk. So I'll start with the motivation. Why trying to uh, solve sign language translation and production is interesting, and especially why it's interesting nowadays. So when talking about sign language uh, translation, the classic motivation that you will mostly read or hear about is that there are all these amount of people uh, with different uh, grades of hearing impairments. And many of them, especially those with severe hearing impairments, they uh, use sign language, so a visual language, to communicate. And that's quite a lot of people uh, worldwide. This, uh, the limitation of not being able, able to fully or, or nothing uh, use spoken languages that uh, has uh, been addressed in different uh, manners. So try to improve their accessibility and their, uh, to, make, to make their lives uh, as complete or enriching or, or even better than those who are using spoken languages through different uh, methods and technologies. And basically uh, I'll be focusing on, on this one, which is sign language access. That's one of the ways that uh, this community uh, has to access services that, or, or yeah, services that maybe they were not originally uh, thought for the um, hearing impairment, uh, people who have suffered hearing impairment losses. So this is important in many aspects, but the, the, probably the central one is that uh, uh, for those uh, people who can only use sign language, uh, of course, that, that's, they often uh, encounter barriers into accessing very important uh, services, like let's say, especially education and health services. That's quite a, a real problem because we are talking about a lot of people. And actually it's, it's in a study from 2009, it was uh, revealed that 68% of the countries that answered to a, a, a survey that was launched at that time, uh, they actually answered that, that um, they did, were not providing sign language access to these health and educational services. So there, there are many people who really cannot access that and that they really struggle to access uh, these services who are uh, thought and designed only for those people who are uh, speaking. So it's kind of a discrimination issue uh, in terms of accessibility because of course they are uh, citizens that should have the equal rights. And the, the situation is even, normally it gets worse and worse uh, when we are looking at developing countries because over there, there are no sign language interpreters that can maybe uh, help uh, users to, to 
talk to a doctor or talk to a teacher uh, to help them to figure out like if they are in pain, if there's some illness, how to uh, address it and how to uh, treat the, any of these problems. So that's a, 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 a central problem for a huge amount of, of people. For example, now right now, if, I mean, you will not be listening to this, but the, I, I cannot just click uh, on a button and, and have an automatic sign language interpreter for what I'm speaking, okay? So if you want to do that, we should hire somebody that should be uh, doing the interpretation simultaneously. So situation just got worse recently uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And actually the deaf community, in this case, the deaf community in the, in the UK, they, they, ha they are, have this campaign called Where is the Interpreter? Because they, they kind of uh, they were uh, expecting uh, to have, uh, in these cases, to have some, somebody that we interpret to be the proxy between uh, they, the, the people using sign languages and those people, doctors or teachers uh, using uh, spoken languages. But now it's, it's even harder, right? Because to the, manic, to the pandemic, more and more medical professionals are treating COVID-19 patients from behind a barrier. So they are using masks that they impede lip breathing, which is something that uh, normally most of the people are, are using when, when uh, interacting with uh, people who cannot speak some language, which is the, the most of the population. And, they are, and uh, because of social distancing, in addition, they are not allowing to have in-person interpreters. So there's a, that's a, nowadays an important problem in a developing, in a developed country like the UK, of course, much worse in developing countries where they don't even have that. They, did, they didn't even have the interpreter before. And on another axis, I would say, uh, the interaction with computers uh, lately has uh, it's been uh, moving into the direction of natural language speaking. So we, we are getting more and more used to these uh, personal assistants that they are getting into our phones, or I would say here, I'm, I'm looking at these home devices, which I, I think it's the most successful case for interaction like uh, these Alexas or Facebook portal or Google Home Max, in which we, we interact with them mostly by speaking to them, if we can speak. Uh, if we cannot, if those people who cannot use uh, spoken languages, they, they really cannot interact with all these services that are probably going to be more and more important uh, year after year. So there's like, again, this problem of accessibility in, in one of these important uh, way for accessing information on computers. So that would be the classic motivations, but I, I can foresee novel motivation that I would like to share with you before jumping into the current state of the art, which is that on the other hand, uh, we can see that um, many technology providers, they are actually developing their own gestures interfaces. So there are all these uh, gestures to, co to control TVs or, 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 or any other device in which uh, each uh, provider is or, or, or maker is inventing new gestures to control your TV or, or, or your Wii or whatever. So, but they are inventing new gestures. Well, maybe, uh, maybe it's, that's enough for to turn the volume up or down and change the, the station or choose your Netflix movie, but, but this is going to get richer. So are they going to invent new gestures to, to communicate with, with the personal assistants? I don't think that, that's, that's, that's scalable, right? That doesn't make any sense. So I argue that uh, sign languages, they could also, they can uh, be very useful to, to, to everybody, not only to people with hearing uh, impairments, but we can use them to, to interact with our uh, computers uh, more and more in some situations. So for example, and also I'll follow this, this, this setup of an uh, in-house um, uh, use of computers with a personal assistant. Uh, in many situations, there are cases when, where, when we don't want to use speech. So let's maybe there's some uh, noisy environment, maybe there's somebody, let's say a baby uh, crying at home, Maybe you, there's somebody else, your, your roommate is watching TV and, and if you speak to the, to the assistant, uh, you'll be disturbing this other person or maybe it's working or maybe somebody else is uh, uh, listening to music. And, and even sometimes that, like, there are like even interferences between the, uh, let's say the, the TV tuner uh, sending orders into the assistant. Um, so in some situations, speech is actually not a good modality to interact with these devices in a natural way. Well, sign language could be. So I kind of argue that sign language can be uh, useful for everybody. So my vision is that uh, through these computer personal assistants and by interacting with them, actually 
uh, we could all learn some languages because the nice thing here is that these devices, they have the potential to teach at a scale. So as we are going to interact, that's the right, the best way to learn a language is by interaction. Of course, nowadays interaction is mostly, is mostly with other people, but more and more we are going to interact in a more natural way with computer devices. And if they can use sign language in the end, it's going to be much easier to everybody to learn sign languages. And if we do that, then we, we of course, will be able to interact with other people with sign language. People with, who have these uh, hearing impairments or deaf people. But also there's another motivation here which is uh, uh, lately we have, or we are all aware that the, when we speak, uh, we are spreading these uh, particles that they may carry these viruses that they have created this pandemic worldwide, like COVID, and maybe there will be some more in the future to come, right? We, that's by speaking. And that's why we are, you are wearing masks if you are in the room as Dimitri was uh, mentioning. Uh, so it's kind of a, dangerous activity or a, a city at risk. Um, if, and actually, uh, for example, in, in Barcelona in, and I think in some places in, in France, there are nowadays like uh, trains uh, in the metro station where they are actually asking people to, to even really not, not speak, okay? And that's because of uh, there's this um, risk of spreading the, the virus uh, when, when speaking, you know, if you wear a mask, there's still a, a very low chance that the, that the particles go through the mask. And of course, you don't speak, the risk even falls more. Um, if all of us could speak some language, we could just use some language in these uh, situations where we want to communicate with other people in a safer way. So again, that's another reason why uh, scaling some language uh, is interesting and that computers are a really good tool to do that. So having said that, having like, all the motivation about why I think that sign language is important, why I think it's important that computers can uh, be proficient with sign language. I will tell you a few things about sign language so you can really understand how this is being addressed from a technical perspective. So let's start a crash course of five minutes on sign languages. So first thing, and then the question that everybody asks uh, when I start speaking with sign language is, is there one sign language? And the answer is no. Uh, like in the same way that there are like multiple spoken languages, there are also multiple uh, sign languages that and their evolution, maybe it's different, not it's related, but sometimes it's really different from the evolutions of the spoken languages. So there is Irish sign language, there's Catalan sign language, there's American British, which are different let's say more similar than maybe to Chinese, but still different languages. There are German, Chinese, plenty of, of sign languages and they are different, uh, different, right? So the one speaker from one community will not be able to speak with uh, another speaker with the other community. Same thing as in spoken languages. Second question that normally people ask is, okay, so is it just a language, uh, a direct one-to-one -one mapping from spoken languages? Because if that was the case, things would be really easy, right? And the answer is no, uh, we cannot just solve sign language translation with a lookup table in, in a sense that we cannot just, just uh, look at the signs, uh, identify the signs and then just look at the table and do a mapping between the signs and, uh, and the words in English. That's something that doesn't work is if you know other languages, if you are listening to this, you, you know English and probably you know other languages and so normally like it doesn't work that you, you, you can map one word from English to one word in another language and things get more and more complicated that the farther you go from the geographical area of the of the use of English right so same thing with sign language that's something we that we cannot do that it will not work well so that's not an option and we should look at other options to to solve the task of sign language translation Something else that uh, people uh, should know to just to follow the, the rest of the talk is that there is a method to transcribe sign language. So textual transcription of sign language. And these are, uh, these are called glosses, okay? Glosses are, you see uh, this sequence of tokens that you can see over here. So these are the, key, the gloss transcription, let's say, of the signs that more or less would translate to this sentence in English. So again, it's not uh, really one-to-one -one 
mapping. But let's say that this textual transcription, it's closer to the signs that uh, are used and also in the in the order in the temporal order of the signs it actually matches the temporal order of the glosses and you see that some of the technical uh, approaches to sign language translation and production they are actually exploiting glosses but you should you must have the glosses first which is another challenge okay but that that's that's important and that's it's useful more thing, what about, is it a language only a uh, language based on hands? So the answer is no. Uh, hands are important, are actually the most important part of the body of the poses when uh, signing uh, sign language. Uh, it's important the hand shape, it's important the orientation and movement and location of the palms, but also there are all these other non-manual features that relate to the head. If we are nodding, if we are shaking, if we are tilting, the mouth, the eyebrows, the cheeks, the facial expression, and also like the position of the body. So everything um, is important to have a full understanding of sign language. So if you are going to solve sign language translation, we should be able to estimate uh, the features, all these features, both manual and non-manual features. And one of, the, for me, one of the most the biggest challenges when dealing with sign language, and I will say that right now I, have, I haven't seen anybody really targeting this or even solving it, which is that uh, in sign language, it's quite common to use uh, a persistent spatial grounding. It means that the, the signer will create a virtual, virtual space will, of objects, and maybe it will, it will refer to them when it's speaking when it's signing okay so for example here you have an, uh, an example in which the signer uh, by making this motion it's saying there's uh, right along here there's an immobile entity located over here uh, over here I should do it with the right hand sorry so so of course like this and, and like this which is saying that there's an entity let's say uh, an object that it's talking about an apple or whatever and it's placing it let's say in this virtual space and when the signer will keep speaking. Whenever it wants to refer to that object, it will point to that virtual location, which is a really nice and challenging task because that's something that our models, our solution should be able to tackle. And then if there's, it may do something else, maybe if it says maybe not far on the right of, uh, there's a tall vertical entity. And then it will virtually, it's defining this new virtual, virtual entity. So, that's, that's quite common in sign language, this spatial grounding. Uh, if, you, if you are familiar with uh, visual grounding tasks with computer vision, we are, we are already struggling in finding pixels in the 2D um, videos or images. So just, you can imagine that that's, it's even harder because the, the object is not there visually, so we, but we must somehow ground our objects in a virtual space. So that's a very nice task. And as far as I know, there's not been solved, but you, you must, be aware that that exists in sign language. Good. So that's the crash course on sign language that I want you to teach you. And now we can move into how the task of sign language translation and production is being addressed nowadays. So what's more or less the state of the art. So first, um, the first uh, news is that there are multiple uh, sign to spoken language task. So how to go from one sign language to another spoken language, or in, well, in this case, it's always sign language to spoken language. So the first task that normally you see in, when, you, when you run uh, a web search and say, uh, look for some nice cool demo on sign language, normally they address the first task, which is finger spelling, which actually um, in sign language, you, you can also spell letters of uh, let's say English or whatever language. So you see that there's this lady that's uh, showing the different signs in, I think it's, that's American Sign Language. And it's, it's just, it's, that's the, I would say the easiest task. Uh, you need to get the, the, the shape of the hand and you are done with finger spelling. And of course it, it's possible to finger spell everything, but that's super slow. I mean, and, and normally that's, that's the resource that, uh, signers use 
when they want to refer to some term that or for which there is no sign. Um, so, or maybe like a, a, a noun of some, some company, of some person, then they spell it. But that's very slow and it's just the, the easiest and, and best interesting task. Then there is a broad uh, work, probably the, the largest um, part of the related words. It's in the task of isolated sign language recognition, which means that the task here is uh, we fit uh, a small video clip where a person is signing only one sign or one very uh, concrete expression. Like for example, uh, this sir over here is signing the I am. So that's the, the first part. And then this task, it considers each sign continuously, uh, sorry, separately isolated, which, okay, it's interesting for the state of, of the art to figure out if we are uh, able to capture the gestures well or the poses, but it's not useful by itself. I mean, when signers are using some language, they, they just, they don't, they don't um, sign one language, uh, sorry, they don't sign only one sign and then go back to a neutral position and then another sign a neutral position. They just continuously sign the different signs. And actually that produces a, a, a phenomenon called co-articulation, which means that when you go from one sign to another, of course, the, shape, the, the, the motion of, your, of our features, of our manual or non-manual features is continuous. And it makes it kind of modifies the 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 actual pose related to to each sign. So you'll you'll find a lot of uh, work over here, but in the end, that will not solve the the final um, task because the final task actually that the one that that the user are interested in, it's when we have a natural sign language uh, use which is continuous, like the the, the last serve over here. And we have a, a continuous, a whole uterine of sign language. Then there are again two different tasks that you will find in the literature. The first one, it's called continuous sign language recognition, which mostly, okay, there are some with some details, but in general, the idea is that we go from the signs to the glosses. So remember that the glosses were the textual transcriptions of the signs. Okay, so they are discrete tokens. That, but they relate to how to transcribe the, the signs. While the final task, which is sign language translation, is when you really go from the, let's say, natural continuous sign language to the natural transcription of the spoken language, that would be uh, to the transcription in English. So in my talk, I will focus in that, this last part in sign language translation, because in the end, that's, that's what we are aiming at. To, the, to be able to uh, produce applications that are uh, useful for, for the community. So if we have sign language translation, actually there's another task, which is the, the opposite, which we'll name it sign language production. Sometimes they call it sign language generation, but okay, I think that many papers they use production, so I use the, this word, which, which is the opposite. So if I have some spoken language, and I want to generate a video that's called sign language production. So we can go from spoken language to sign language or from sign language to spoken language. These are the, the two, uh, let's say more complex tasks that nowadays uh, many researchers are, are tackling. So if you are a little bit aware of uh, natural language processing, um, at this point, probably you, you, you can anticipate what's coming next. So if we want to solve this task of sign language translation and sign language production, we can uh, maybe try to adopt the principles that have been very successful in the last, let's say seven years or so for machine translation from spoken languages. So uh, you're probably aware, and if not, I can explain that in the same way how deep learning has been uh, broadly adopted in the field on computer vision, in parallel, it has been broadly adopted in the field of natural language uh, processing. And while in computer vision, the, the first task that was tackled uh, and that really was the breakthrough, that was the image classification with ImageNet in natural language processing, the, the first task that was addressed was 
actually neural machine translation. So machine translation going from one language into another. So uh, how to go from uh, English to, for example, to, to Irish. The idea more or less is that you have, you take the sequence of tokens in English, you encode them with a neural network into uh, some neural representation. And then there's a decoder that takes this neural representation and decodes it into Irish or whatever language you want. So if there was this success in these discrete spoken languages, why not trying to adopt the same thing with sign language? Also in parallel, or maybe a bit later, uh, there was also uh, a similar approach to do speech recognition. So, uh, so in the end, neural machine translation, we are in the same modality, but could we go from one modality to another? That's what uh, normally the same authors more or less uh, look at. So they, now they don't have a discrete sequence like in uh, the, the English transcription of English, but now we have a continuous sequence of the, the waveform of the speech. But more or less, and of course with some tweaks, uh, the idea is the same. We encode the speech into a representation and then we can decode it into a, a discrete sequence of tokens. And probably if you're in computer vision, that's the task that maybe the first time that, that, that you saw combining language and vision is the task of image caption. And again, the same authors, if you just follow the name of the authors, more or less the, the same, uh, what they say is, okay, see so if, if the people in computer vision, they were so successful, in image specification by encoding images with uh, convolution neural networks, why not trying to, why don't we take our decoders for language and feed them over these representations? And that's a, the principle of image captioning. We encode the image, we decode the sequence of, of tokens that describe the image. So great, so if we can solve neural machine translation, um, speech recognition, Image captioning, now what we have, it's a bit, it's a little bit more complex. It's not a still image, it's a video, but there's, there are also works on video captioning. So we have uh, a video, we encode the video, and then we just need, we, then we just, okay, with many co quotes, uh, need to decode what it was uh, being signed into spoken language. And in the end, that's, that's the basic idea that nowadays is being uh, adopted and explored in the field. So the pioneers in these approaches, or one of the pioneers on these approaches are the, the research team from the University of Surrey in the UK and Aachen University in Germany, that basically they, they did what you would expect. They took the video frames, they encode them with a CNN, and then for each of the video frames, or maybe they, they simplify a little bit, um, they fit that into a recurring neural network, which were at that time they were very popular for processing sequences. So the, 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 few, the people from natural language processing and speech, they were very familiar with them. Uh, you encode the video and then you start decoding the words. Uh, so in such a way that you decode the first, the first word and then when you have this first word, you fit up the input and you decode the second word. That's called the sec to sec model approach for neural machine translation. Now maybe you have already seen it in videos as well now. So we can go from a sequence of video frames into a sequence of discrete tokens of words. In 2018, they did that with uh, RNNs to process the sequences. And if you have been follow also following the state of the art in deep learning, you can anticipate that some years later, what they did is they, they replaced the RNNs with a transformer architecture that some years ago it uh, became uh, the state of the art for neural machine translation. So again, it's the idea is to take what the, the people in natural language processing are doing and kind of adopt it for the task of sign language translation. And that's what uh, last year they presented that on, on CVPR. The same team, they also look at the opposite direction uh, to the production. So they, the idea now is, if you remember, we have the English transcription. Now our goal is to generate the video. And again, we have encode it and then decode it. For this task, so far, what I have seen that that does something. I, I would not say that this is okay. There are papers. I would not, I will not say that these tasks are solved. So if you are interested, there's there's still a lot of room for improvement. Okay, but this is what what it is as as video is a, such a high dimensional uh, space, 
And we know that we are basically interested in the poses of the human poses. So what many research labs are, are doing is uh, we are using a, a, an intermediate step, which is extracting the body poses. These are these skeletons. So we predict, we use some off the shelf tool for uh, pose estimation. So that provides us the joints of uh, the, the, the arms, the hands, facial expression. And these coordinates are the ones that we actually uh, use uh, to, to decode or to represent the video. And then once we have these skeletons later, uh, we do the, the final transfer into video doing something else. So we kind of split the task into, but basically because this is very tough. And also when, when we use with, when we use skeletons, we kind of um, disentangle the part of domain adaptation because you, you see, we have the, the, our data sets for some language where they are very well recorded in a green studio. But of course, if you try to deploy that into a real world, you will not have these setups. But if, if you manage to, to have a good pose estimation and there are tools that kind of tackle pose estimation like in the wild, then it's decoupled, right? So if you have the right pose estimation, then we can really uh, just uh, fit the, our poses in with our data set of sign language and try to solve the sign language uh, task. So some examples of this approach for sign language production, again, the same team from the University of Surrey, they have this task of called progressive, this work called progressive transformers that more or less they just, again, they use transformers and now the input is a sequence of tokens. You see that uh, these tokens, they are normally uh, in German because they, they, the state of the art at that time data set for this task is a, a data set called Phoenix that is based on uh, videos from ger, uh, weather forecast in the German uh, broadcast TV. So you have a sequence of uh, words in, in German and then uh, you decode a sequence of poses. And after that, uh, they also have another work where they take these poses and they actually use a, a GAN to actually generate the, the video frames. So you can compare here the quality of their generated um, video frames. So the, the ones on top, they, 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 are, uh, they generate the, the video frames from the poses that was estimated with the transformer. So they are, they are again, they are decoupled, okay? And you, compare, you can compare them with the quality uh, of the ground truth data that they are using for their data set. So in our lab, we did, we kind of explored this task. Uh, so we, 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 we transfer, actually in our case, we didn't do the part of translation. We just explored the, the, the part of um, generating the video from the poses. And our question was, is it, so the state of the art techniques that allow to generate video with the poses, is it that good enough for sign language? So here you can see that there's this lady in, uh, with the brown, uh, shirt, we are transferring her pose to the lady with a black shirt. Okay, so now we'll just briefly explain what we did. So we, we go from this lady, we extract the poses with another shelf tool called open pose, and then we generate the, we transfer the motion with a tool that was state of the art at that time uh, called Everybody Dance Now. So I'll show you some results so you can assess by yourself uh, the quality of what we obtained uh, last year, I think it was. So what we are doing is we are generating the video on, on the right from the video on the left. And we do that by, uh, again, we extract the open pose and then we just animate the, the, the video on the right, on the right. The video on the right, in this case, that we are based on uh, everybody dance now. Actually, what we did is we train a new network specific for that lady. So we did that and then we show the results to uh, some language speakers and we show them two uh, videos. We show them the skeletons only and the videos, so photorealistic videos. And we ask them a few questions. First of, of, first of all, we ask them to solve a classification task. So our videos, they had these uh, 10 categories and we ask them to, to assign a category of the, to the video. So that's kind of the easiest task you can think about. It's kind of a topic detection task. And they did pretty well. I mean, most of the cases they, they could uh, identify the quality of the, the topic, but uh, with a gun-generated video, and it was better with the gun-generated video than with the skeletons. 
But when we asked them if they could understand, so beyond the topic, if they could really understand what was signing, they were not very happy. So we use this mini opinion score, which is a survey that we asked them. They, they rank from one to five. So five would be perfect understanding and values were kind of average. So there's the, 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 the task was, was not solved at all, okay? And if we look also to these metrics for translation, uh, performance was very poor. So I would say that we, that was not solved, okay? And especially that was because of the hands, uh, the, the synthesis of the hands. There is a similar work also from, again, the University of Surrey, where they obtain um, better visual um, characteristics of the, of the uh, people, but um, there is no assessment over users, so I cannot tell you if, if, if the uh, sign language speakers can really understand this video, but visually the, the results were better than ours. Okay, so now that I have explained uh, the task of sign language, translation and sign language production, I would like to propose you some challenges that we can maybe we can discuss later during the Q&A and also give you some of our uh, advances in, on, on them. So I think that there are challenges for everybody here. Uh, there are challenges in computer vision, in NLP, in speech, and in the data or meta learning maybe. And I will just go through some of them. So first of all, for the computer vision community, that should be you. Uh, we have observed that basically when uh, I was saying that in our approach, we are assuming that we can extract the both of the signers. And we have assumed, we have observed that that's not working uh, very well or, or it should work better at least to do sign language. So we, we have run state-of-the-art uh, post estimators for our videos and we see, you see that there, there are some problems. So for example, in, in this one, the hand disappears. So sometimes the, the, the hands, they are blurry, they move pretty fast and that creates many problems. And normally that's not the, maybe that's not the, what, what the state of the art uh, post estimators are, were trained or optimized for. And also, for example, in this one where they actually have a 3D reconstruction of the hand, um, this hand should be the one on the right hand. So the pose is totally wrong. Now I have some qualitative results that I can, uh, show you, I need to play it, I need to do this model, I'm sorry, but uh, that's, so this, the hand on the right, it should follow the, the, the right hand. So, so this, this hand over here, it should follow the right hand of the signer, okay? And you will see that it often fails. That's from a CPR uh, paper from last year. So we just run it in our data set and it didn't really work that well, so, or not well enough. We tried with another uh, work also from uh, ECCB from last year. Again, I need to play it uh, slower. You, so that's gonna be really hard to follow. Okay, and again, you'll see that now sometimes the hand disappears, that the pose is not that correct in some case, now it disappears. So it's really, really difficult to, to translate anything with when your hand is actually disappearing most of the time. So that we have a lot of work with the hand pose estimation. Actually, we, we also run in our data set that I'll talk about later, this progressive transformer task. And that's what, that, what you can see on the left. We then managed to, to, to play, to run it, to have 10 good results. You see that the, the hands that we show on the left, they are mostly not moving. Well, they should be moving like the, what you see on the right. So we think that there are still room for improvement in, on, on all these tasks, also for the generation of hands. And also we recently, we, we tried another word that's not on sign language, but there's this CPR paper where they try to estimate realistic body shapes uh, from the, the body gestures, it's called body to hands. And again, the results, they are not realistic at all. I mean, they, even, if we even after training it with our data set of sign language, you see that the hands, they are mostly static. Uh, they should be like moving. Uh, we even try to condition with the language and we are struggling with that. So in the end, the, 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 the conclusion is that taking off the, off the shelf state-of-the-art works and trying to use them in sign language, that's, that's not straightforward. In our case, we didn't, we didn't succeed in any of them yet and we are working on that. Then if you are interest, interested in NLP, I think that there's a lot of um, challenges there. Um, because sign languages, they are from a linguistic perspective, 
That's what it's called a very uh, low resource language. So in, in NLP, there's translation community, there's this low resource language. I guess that Irish should be, could be a low resource language. Catalan is a low resource language for sure. And some language is really very low. It means that, that you cannot uh, have tons and tons of content like in English where they, you can just go online to Wikipedia and download like millions and millions of, of resources. And just to make it more complicated, some language uh, different to the spoken languages that where you have like these discrete, very nice tokens, which are the words. In some language, we have video, which is a super, very higher dimensional problem. So the task is, is it's, 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 I think it's much harder than, than when you're dealing with just spoken language that you can transcribe in words. For me, like uh, I expect advances in, in, in having what's called these language models. Uh, again, maybe you already know what they are, but basically they, ha they have been uh, well known in the community of NLP for a long, long time. We basically, it's, it's this representation of discrete tokens, which will be the, the words that you learn with the neural network. In one way, and you learn them in a self-supervised task, one of them could be, for example, to predict the next word. Okay, so you have, you download the whole Wikipedia and you train your neural network to predict, like, given a sequence of words, to predict the, the next word. And you can have a huge amount of data with that, and you can train very powerful representations. These are language models. I haven't seen language models for instant language yet, and I don't even know what they are and how they should be trained. Also, uh, probably you have heard about these uh, very large pre-trained models. Uh, probably the most important, uh, most famous one is GPT-3. Recently, people from Star Stanford, they have named them foundation models. And the question is like, can we use that in some language and how to use it? Again, for me, that's an open question. I tried some, uh, just for, for, to play a little bit, I tried to use GPT-3 to go from English to, um, to the glosses of American Sign Languages. Uh, these are the results that I obtained. Uh, I must say that I have no idea if they are good enough or not, but that's something that we are looking at. And I maybe that's the right way to go. I, I don't know. Maybe the GPT-3, you know, they, they train with a lot of uh, data from the internet. If you are on, on true speech, um, there's a, a field in speech that's called end-to-end -end speech translation. So the idea is that to do machine translation, uh, normally I would say the classic pipeline now, now is you go from, you do, you first run uh, automatic speech recognition. So you go from speech to words. Then if you want to translate to another language, you go from words in English, let's say to words in Irish. And then if you want to go to speech again, you would need a speech synthesis and you have like words in Irish to speech synthesizer. And that's, let's say the, the classic approach. But now there are people who are trying to do translation directly from speech to speech. So English speech to Irish speech. And it, this, this is nice because if you can solve it, that's actually that's a task that most of the cases you want to solve. And if we can train a neural network that does this task, probably this network will be lighter than going through all these intermediate steps of uh, trying to predict the discrete tokens, the words in English and the words in Irish. So my vision is that in the end, this field will work well and to a speech translation. And also my vision is that that's gonna happen also in, in sign language. And just to finish the last language lang uh, challenge, it's regarding the training data. Um, so I will use this uh, nice diagram from Dima Damen from Bristol. And I think it's very nice to try to understand different ways how training data and labels and pre-training is being used nowadays, especially with deep learning models, okay? So it has this cube where it has that training data over here. This will be, in our cases, there will be the, the videos uh, of the signs, the labels, in our case, that will be the transcriptions, right? From in English, let's say, if we're doing American Sign Language translation and pre-training if maybe we train our models with ImageNet or whatever. So we have our labels here, our data there. And then with this chart, they, they propose this, call, they call them supervision level skills. And they are very useful. I suggest that you look at them and I will explain how I see the challenges in training data based on this chart. So um, the classic approach when we are doing a fully supervised classic sign language translation. So the, the, the solutions that I presented earlier on sign language translation, that's a classic thing. So we have a, we need to have fully uh, supervised setup. 
So to do that, we need a parallel corpus. I mentioned earlier that people are right now, they are mostly using a data set in German. And the idea is that if we have a parallel corpus for us two languages, let's say for example, English and French, then we can train a neural, net, a neural model to go from one language to another. But collecting this parallel corpus, that's costly and there are not that many, okay? So the data set that I was mentioning in German, it's this one. There are some other ones. And I will just go through this table to present one of our um, most recent and more important contributions, which is the how to sign data set. So in our lab, basically Amanda Duarte, um, we collected a new data set called how to sign for American Sign Language. And I will, we have uh, RGB videos, we have the, the depth sensors, we already extracted key points from open both. So there are some mistakes there. And also we have a subset of videos that we also recorded in a multi-camera uh, setup uh, studio called the Panoptic Studio at CMU. And we align everything into an existing data set that's called how to sign of instructional videos. It means that our uh, signers, uh, translators, we show them instructional videos and they were translating them. Nice thing is that for this data set that it already existed, we have, of course, the videos on YouTube. We already have the speech track and we also have the English transcription. So this how to sign for American Sign Language. And now I will explain why this is much larger and better than the existing data sets. It's a parallel corpus, right? So first, if we focus only on American Sign Language, you can see that the vocabulary is much larger than existing solutions and the amount of videos is much longer. We, if we focus on um, transcription, so all these data sets, they have the transcription in whatever language, but we are the only ones that we align that with speech. So if you want to do end-to-end -end, uh, speech to sign translation, how to sign right now, it's the only data set that can allow you to do that. As we built it on this how-to data set, we have this alignment with the uh, speech and the transcription that comes from how to. So we can really focus on the sign language production and translation with how to sign. In how to, so the data set that already existed, we have the English speech, the English transcription. And actually, if you even want to do translation with our data set, there are also English to Brazilian translation, that, which can be even more interesting from uh, if you are doing NLP, I would say that's very interesting as well. Also compared to other existing data sets, we have the depth sensor, okay? There was all, only this Chinese data set that had it. So we provide the depth uh, sensor data that we, take, we took in two different studios. In the green studio, which actually first we have uh, two views, a side view and a frontal view with two HD RGB cameras and also another kinetic camera that provides the depth sensor. And again, as I mentioned earlier, we have for a subset, we went to this Panoptic Studio with more than 400 um, cameras. So we have multiple views of the, of the signers. Oops, let's see. We extracted the poses as well. So they are already available. You, can, you need to compute them. Again, they, they are a bit noisy, but that's what gives you the state of the art. So we have these 2D poses, but also we have 3D poses for, for the recordings of the, from the Panoptic Studio. So we have the coordinates in 3D space. And if you look at the, again, at the uh, duration that's much larger than, uh, or similar to the other existing data sets. So we, we, su we suggest, we invite you to use how to sign if you are going to deal with uh, sign language. So, but, uh, beyond supervised learning, we think that there are plenty of opportunities, opportunities for uh, sign language in a more a weekly supervised setup. So where the labels, they are not manually notated, but maybe they are generated with basically with other algorithms. Uh, so we have like zero labels. Um, we think that that's a very promising approach because for us building how to sign has been very costly, a lot of resources, and it's very expensive. So probably if we can somehow use other tools to generate pseudo labels in an automatic way, in a cost-free way, that's going to be very interesting. So for example, things we can do in a pseudo label setup, we could generate glosses for our data sets by pre-training a neural network that goes from English to glosses. So maybe we, we, we can train a transformer. Actually, we tried in 2018 to do that, to go from English to glosses. 
So if we train that, then we can, for example, augment how to sign with glosses. So we tried at that time, it didn't work very well, but more recently there was this team um, from Kayoyin um, that did it and obtained better results. So if you want to explore that, you should start with this work. And then there's also this uh, team from BGG, Oxford and Paris that they're doing lots of very nice and smart um, techniques to, to generate labels from video uh, in a in a kind of a weekly supervised ways, but basically they are generating seal labels in many different ways. For example, they have a tool that allows to segment the videos into, into signs. So actually they pre-train in one domain that they, they propose a technique that if you have another data set, you can transfer the, the segmentation tools to the new data set. So we are actually trying to do that with how to sign, it looks pretty well. And also they have this other tool um, that aligns the subtitles that maybe provides YouTube to you. So there are many videos on YouTube where you have uh, whatever video and then an overlaid signer on top, but the, the, the subtitles, they are aligned with the speech and the person that is signing, it's, it's not temporally aligned with that, right? So you, we have the, the, the alignment of the audio and then the alignment of the person who is signing. And this should be aligned if you want to build a parallel corpus and doing that manually it's very costly. We have done it for how to sign, but for, for a part of how to sign, because it's super, super expensive to do that. Manually, you need really need to, to move the alignment. And but they have this tool that it's also very interesting to align subtitles. So just to conclude and finish up, um, this is my view that I that I see for sign language. I think that in the next years, uh, hopefully we'll move from end-to-end -end solutions that go from speech to video. That's why our project overall, it's called speech to science, or if you go from the science to the speech, science to speech. And um, that uh, nowadays people are, are looking at very many intermediate um, solutions. So from speech, of course, from going from speech to language that has been broadly exploited, like automatic, automatic speech recognition or speech synthesis, depending on the direction, then we have seen some words that they are really using glosses. Some people are thinking that there's even another way to transcribe signs, which is common for all languages because glosses are exclusive for each sign language. But there's another type of transcription that it's just modeling the shape of, of, the, of the post that it can be universal for all sign languages. This can be another option. Um, as I mentioned in our team, we are using poses uh, 3D poses, you have the, the depth, 2D poses, you only have like the, the X, Y. And for example, the Oxford team, they, they are provided to, to segment the videos. Okay, so we, you can just take each, each of these steps separately. Each of them probably it's, it's already a, a nice challenge, but I would I think that in, in the very end, we will just put everything together with many, lots of data, many zero annotations because annotating large data sets at scale that's unfeasible, it's impractical. We have seen many good results uh, for the classic uh, natural language processing community. So I think that some language will also follow this path. And it's uh, a word that it's impactful in a societal way as I motivated at the very end. Just to finish, um, if you are interested in multimodal, but maybe your background is only in computer vision, and you want to know more about deep learning for speech or language or whatever. Actually, last year I virtually presented an ICMR a tutorial on how to how to deal with language vision, audio, and speech in deep neural networks. And if you then check it out, I invite you to just to click there and you can see the videos and lectures that are presented there. And that will be it uh, from my side. Thank you very much. If you are interested in our data set, you can find it here. If you are interested in working with us on sign language, you can reach me on Twitter, uh, by email. You can also check all our smaller reports that we have been publishing all together. And that will be it. Thank you very much.